Hi, I'm Mary Pomerantz Dauber from the Jewish Book Council, and I'm pleased to welcome you today to today's discussion. As always, we're so appreciative of having you join us here. This is the first in a series of events around the fall 2020 Natan Notable Books winner from left to right, Lucy S. Davidovich, The New York Intellectuals and the Politics of Jewish History by Dr. Nancy Sinkoff, and is being sponsored by Jewish Book Council, Natan Fund, and Shalom Hartman Institute of North America. Our mission at Jewish Book Council is to educate and enrich the community through Jewish literature. Visit jewishbookcouncil.org to learn about JBC's reviews, essays, literary journal paper brigade, our book club resources, author tours, and our literary awards. A word of thanks to our panelists, Nancy and Yehuda Kurtzer. We're looking forward to learning from you and to our audience. We hope you'll support today's authors by purchasing a copy of their books using the links in our chat. Thank you to our partners in Natan Fund and Shalom Hartman Institute of North America. The Hartman Institute is a leading center of Jewish thought and education serving Israel and North America. Their mission is to strengthen Jewish peoplehood, identity, and pluralism to enhance the Jewish democratic character of Israel and to ensure that Judaism is a compelling force for good in the 21st century. You can find out more about the Shalom Hartman Institute with a link in the chat and by attending some of their upcoming events, including one with Dr. Kurtzer tonight um, at 8 p.m. One quick housekeeping note, if any of you in the audience would like to share your own questions during the talk, you're more than welcome to, but please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And now I'd like to introduce Felicia Herman, Executive Director of Natan Fund, who will tell you more about Natan Notable Books and our panelists, and will also moderate today's conversation. Felicia? Thanks, Mary. Um, I'll be moderating today on my hotspot, on a phone, with a computer in the background. So you'll just forgive me, hopefully, if anything goes awry, but such are the challenges of our time. Um, I'm so excited to have this uh, conversation today um, with Nancy and Yehuda. And I want to thank the Jewish Book Council and uh, Yehuda and the Hartman Institute um, for partnering with us on this. So I am the executive director of Natan. Natan is a venture philanthropy fund and a giving circle. Our members invest their philanthropic dollars together um, in cutting edge emerging nonprofit organizations in Jewish communities around the world and in Israel. And usually, um, you know, for, for many years, we only supported nonprofit organizations and social businesses and social entrepreneurs. Uh, but a few years ago, we also started branching out into the world of written ideas by creating a book award. Um, in partnership now with the Jewish Book Council. Twice a year, Natan Notable Books recognizes recently published or soon to be published nonfiction books that promise to catalyze important conversations that are aligned with the themes of our grant making. And Professor Sinkoff's beautiful book, which is the winner of the Fall 2020 Award, I guess anything with 2020 in it now will forever have a funny asterisk on it, but um, 2020 brought us this beautiful book. Um, that is a work of wide ranging, diligent scholarship emanating from a deep understanding of a century of Jewish history in America and Eastern Europe. It's a deep dive into the life and work and intellectual contributions of an underappreciated and maybe nearly forgotten historian and public intellectual, Lucy Davidovich, who died in 1990. One of the reasons why our book uh, committee chose this book is because the parallels that, are we going to call her Lucy or Davidovich? It's so much more fun to call her Lucy. Um, the parallels between the issues that she tackled in her time and those that we are struggling with now are uncanny. And we really believe that her life offers a model for all of us for how to think through the many challenges that are facing contemporary Jews um, in America and beyond from a position deeply grounded in an engagement with Jewish history and culture. So today we're going to use her remarkable life and her fascinating political evolution, um, which Nancy's going to tell us much more about, as a jumping off point for understanding contemporary Jewish political diversity. So we all know the saying, two Jews, three opinions. We all know the joke about the Jew on the desert island who builds two synagogues, one for himself and one that he will not step foot into. Um, Jewish texts and Jewish history are rife with dissension and debate and disagreement. We are not one people with one sense of how to move through the world. And many of our most precious texts preserve those debates for us to use as jumping off points for our own contemporary debates. 
In fact, you just have to look at our nation state of Israel, um, which probably has already invented a couple of new political parties just in the 10 minutes that we've been on the phone together um, to know that Jews do not always agree with each other. And that is part of our strength. But there's something that feels different in the air these days um, than in recent memory, something that feels more zealous, more religious about our disagreements, almost like there are more battles between good and evil, um, battles that might even explode into violence rather than principled but open-minded stances about which reasonable minds might disagree. And the very principles of classical liberalism like free inquiry, the value of the marketplace of ideas and appreciation for viewpoint diversity, these feel like they're, they're under attack. So that is part of what we'll be talking about today, using Lucy's life and the history that she wrote um, and taught um, to help us think through our present circumstances and hopefully so that we can all build a strong future for all of us. She went against the popular grain in Jewish communities, always rooting her political shifts and her love for and commitment to the Jewish people. So we're lucky to have two brilliant uh, scholars with us today to help tease apart these complicated issues, two thinkers who draw on their own deep understanding of the past in order to help them understand the present. Nancy Sinkoff is Professor of Jewish Studies and History at Rutgers University and the Academic Director of the Allen and Joan Bildner Center for the Study of Jewish Life. She's a specialist in early modern and modern Jewish history, especially intellectual and Eastern European history. And she's the author of numerous books and articles that address various elements of this history. She's also, thank goodness, responsible for the reissuing of Lucy's memoir, her beautiful memoir, um, from that place and time about the pivotal years 1938 to 1947, which I know Nancy will tell us more about in a moment. And Yehuda Kurtzer is the president of the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America, the North American arm of the Jerusalem-based Hartman Institute. Yehuda created Hartman North America in 2010 and has since turned it into one of the most, one of the foremost institutions of Jewish learning in North America educating rabbis, lay leaders, Jewish professionals, and leaders of other faith communities. Especially relevant for our conversation today about the interaction between the past and the present, Yehuda is also the author of Shuva, The Future of the Jewish Past, which offers new thinking to contemporary Jews on navigating the tensions between history and memory. And he's the co-editor most recently, just in the last, what, couple of weeks or months, of the New Jewish Canon, a collection of the most significant Jewish ideas and debates of the last two generations. Okay, enough from me, let's get started. Nancy, we're gonna start with you. Um, start please by telling us just something about Lucy Davidovich. Give us a quick synopsis of her life for those in the audience who might not be familiar with her. Okay, so first three seconds of thank yous to Natan, to the Jewish Book Council, to the staffs of those organizations and of course the Shalom Hartman Institute. I'm just thrilled, overjoyed to be in conversation with Yehuda and with you, Felicia, and with these dynamic organizations of Jewish culture. So thank you, thank you. Of course, I'm very honored by the award. That didn't hurt either. Um, so let me just uh, try very quickly to give you a sense of Lucy Davidovich's biography, which is extraordinary because the 20th century was quite an extraordinary century for the Jews as well as the world. Lucy S. Davidovich was born as Lucy Schildkret, a Jewish immigrant daughter in 1915. She dies in 1990. So the first thing for you to understand is that she does parallel, her life does parallel that of the well-known, very famous male New York intellectuals. And my book in many ways is trying to offer a corrective to the ways in which scholars have understood the Jewish, the American Jewish encounter with modernity because Lucy has a different pathway and yet intersects with those men in many ways. Born in 1915, she's educated in New York City public schools, including the very selective Hunter High School for Girls and Hunter College for Women. And simultaneously, she is educated in Yiddishist institutions. And this is key to understanding her and understanding the ways in which she moves politically and how she understands issues affecting the world and the Jews. Her deep rootedness in diaspora nationalist institutions, including the Sholem Lachem Folk Institute and the YIVO. And again, very quickly in 1938, after 
struggling with employment. She majored in English at Hunter. The depression economy was still affecting interwar um, immigrant Jews. She decides to go to Vilna, Poland, to be a graduate student, essentially, at the YIVO Institute, which had a program for fellows and um, others. This is a formative experience for her. She lives in Vilna from August 1938 to August 1939. The drums of war are beating on the West from Germany. The fear of the Soviet Union is real, particularly for Polish Jews who knew what Soviet encroachment on Jewish life meant. She leaves in August 1939 after the signing of the Hitler-Stalin Pact in a train trip that today we would call traumatic. She goes from Vilna to Warsaw to Berlin to Copenhagen, waiting a ship to sail back to the United States. In the next six years of her life in the United States, she works at the skeletal New York YIVO with its director, Max Weinreich. She returns to Europe after the war for essentially 15 months to work for the JDC, the Joint Distribution Committee, with survivors, refugees, and an international cohort of Jewish uh, communal activists. Again, this idea of Jewish peoplehood is part and parcel of her life experiences. And she then returns to the United States, gets married in 1948, and for two decades works at the American Jewish Committee. And that section of my book is entitled Becoming an American, which is somewhat paradoxical, and I'm happy to talk about it. But there we see Lucy S. Davidovich encountering mainstream Jewish politics, encountering a German Jewish uh, organization that had defined the Jews as a religion, not as a people. The historical context is the Cold War, when the American uh, landscape has invited in Judaism was one of the three monotheistic you know, faiths, you know, Protestant, Catholic, and Jew in Will Herberg's very apt phrase. So American Jews are increasingly seeing themselves as a quote unquote religion, which is a deeply problematic uh, position for someone who's a diaspora nationalist who believe that Jews are first a people. I give this to you because this is part of her own wrestling of how to define herself now in the American Cold War context as a committed Jew who doesn't really have religion. What does she have to do to understand her people in this new context? Because the East European solution, that is Jewish folkness or Jewish Gemeinschaft or Jewish uh, Amiyut, whatever, you, whatever word you want to use, doesn't exactly fit in the American landscape. And then we have her politics. In those years, she had moved from youthful flirtation with communism to being an FDR Democrat, a liberal working at the American Jewish Committee, which has great liberal bona fides in terms of church state, what was then called Negro Jewish relations, liberal anti-communism. But to the, from the mid to late 60s, American society is ripped apart by many things that we seem to be revisiting today, a crisis of urban life a fissure between nationalism on the part of African-Americans and Jewish integration. Uh, the question of meritocracy, does it exist? Who gets it? Uh, whiteness, are Jews coded as white? Were they white in the late 60s? All of these issues are very much at the forefront of American society in the late 60s. And Davidovich, quite either presciently or uh, chutzpahdikly, if that's not a word, it really isn't one, she goes against the grain, as Felicia mentioned. She argues that Jewish interests lie with moving to the right, moving to the right, as making sure that Jews affirm Jewishness, Jewish integrity, the value of an international Jewish community. And of course, in 1967, with the victory of Israel in the Six Day War, Israel as a modern state of the Jews is now positioned as a bully and not as an underdog, not the David, but rather Goliath or Goliath. And the new left and the counterculture and militant nationalisms in America become anti-colonial and position Israel as an oppressor. And for Davidovich, this is an assault, not on the politics of Israel, but on the body of the Jews, the body politic of the Jews, the embodiment of the Jews. And this uh, recoiling from her perspective is necessary to defend Jewish interests. And this, critique of Israel, militant black nationalism that has some anti-Semitic uh, articulations among black intellectuals. These things move her rightward. And very famously in 1984, she stands up all five foot feet of her, which is not very tall, 
and announces to the Jewish uh, public at the 92nd Street Y, then a very essential venue for Jewish public intellectual life and says, wake up American Jews, it's time for you to vote for the Republican Party. And she says, if you consider me Attila the Hun, so be it. So from 1984 until her death, she was what she called an independent neoconservative. And I argue in my book that the only way to understand, or not the only, the way to understand this is her lifelong commitment to diaspora nationalism and the integrity and dignity and autonomy of Jewish peoplehood, regardless of politics and not being harnessed to a particular either mythology of Jewish political life. Um, that's who she is. And the last thing I'll say is when I did this book and I used 45 archives to do it, everywhere I looked, she was present, meaning she corresponded with everyone internationally, German, German intellectuals, French intellectuals, Israeli intellectuals, Yiddishist, American conservatives, American lefties. And that tells us something about the record of a woman who has been ignored. And it begs the question, why is it that we don't remember Lucy S. Davidovich and the world can't get enough of someone like Hannah Arendt. I'll leave it there. That in fact is gonna be part of the topic of our next book uh, discussion is Hannah Arendt and Lucy Davidovich. But before we zoom out to the communal issues writ large, maybe we could stay with Lucy just as a person for a few, for a few more moments. She, as you just, you know, brilliantly succinctly summarized her whole, the arc of her whole life in just a few minutes. That must have been personally, you know, if you could just talk to, talk to us about her as a person and, you know, the, the, what it took for a, a short woman, you know, in her time, travel internationally in a, in a, you know, in the time of an incoming war and then the post war she goes back, you know, to Europe again. Um, she plays this extraordinary role for a woman, um, first of all, and so that alone, I think, sort of makes her, it's not a, you're not a contrarian by being a woman, but she's sort of counter to the grain, you know, of most of the people active in Jewish leadership at that time. And then as she moves rightward, as you noted, she's part, but not really part of a whole community of Jewish intellectuals, Jewish neoconservatives, and even that she's sort of standing apart. And she's very consciously um, differing with the bulk of American Jewry, basically, at, at all these points in her life. So tell us just more about her as a person. Like, help us to understand the, the, how, did, how it is that she came to be this, this person of extraordinary, I would say, courage and strength, you know, at a time where she's constantly sort of going against the grain. Well, you know, you're getting into psychology, which is a fair question and hard to parse, at least the kind of historian that I am. Uh, temperamentally, she was, uh, you know, I like to think she was a hunter college girl. I say that with enormous uh, uh, pride, having encountered many hunter college women. <clears throat> they were well-educated, self-confident -conf intellectuals. They were every bit as smart as the men of City College, but the social environment of their day, they did not have access in the same way to positions of public, uh, to public forums, right? Many of them became school teachers, which we know is a, was seen as a, a not impressive or not socially mobile uh, profession. And then many married, had children and stayed, quote, at home. Now, not everyone did, there are important exceptions um, and we could enumerate them, Ruth Gruber comes to mind, other people, but it was a more typical uh, position for these very smart women to kind of step back into a, a private sphere, if you will. For all kinds of re reasons, Lucy did not. She married relatively late in life. She never had her own natal children. Her husband, whom she married, was 20 years older than she was. He was a copy editor. She had to have a public life. So the question is, she had to earn a living. So, you know, the question is what came first, her temperament, her dis-ease with a kind of domesticity of typical mid-century American Jewish women, or was her circumstances foist upon her, she had to make a living. So I, I'm not really sure I can untangle that. And, um, and but what, what we do know is she did have to make a living. And she, when she applied to the American Jewish Committee, she did so as a secretary. 
Okay, and again, just think of that and then worked your way up to be the director of research. So I think we can't downplay without, not that you would, but not without getting hysterical about the kind of patriarchal society in which she was entering. You know, women were expected to be in a certain place socially and she was quite different. And um, she had to prove herself all the time. And I think that effort, and you kind of alluded to it in terms of her contrariness, that gets, that's exhausting. It's exhausting to sort of always demand to, be take, demand to be taken seriously. And I think that many women of that generation felt that. Um, the late Paula Hyman, who um, knew Lucy and they differed politically, once said to me there was a kind of bitterness in her. And I think part of that bitterness was not only the trauma of losing all of Eastern Europe and of losing her husband and of the political change, but it's kind of exhaustion, a kind of feminine exhaustion of, I can't believe I have to, I'm the only woman in the room and I have to prove myself again. So I think that, that that's part of it. She didn't express it that much, but you can see it. And um, I think the other aspect there is more cultural, which is being an East European, very much an East European Jew where East European Jewish culture, even today, is misunderstood. No one knows that East European Jews were modern. I mean, I could go on and on about that's a pet peeve of mine, that they were multilingual, that they weren't all religious, that not all of them were pious, that they didn't all live in Stettlach, that they, you know, that uh, Bruno Schultz was a modernist like Virginia Woolf. I mean, I could go on and on because no one, the image of a benighted, obscurantist, impoverished Eastern European Jewry remains. And she had to fight against that too, against the nostalgia, and also against the kind of apotheosis of German Jewish culture. So I think that was wearying also for her, you know, to try and convince people that Yiddish culture wasn't only about Schund literature, but was a deeply modernist, modernist form of Jewish creativity. It's exhausting to constantly be barking up that tree and not being heard. So I think it informs her temperament, a kind of embitteredness, a bit of being a bit of a scold, being um, impatient, uh, and at times being unforgiving. She was unforgiving with certain, there were certain red lines in her life personally. And if you cross them, like Alfred Kazin, that was it. She turned her back, she wasn't interested. I hope I address that. Yeah, it's fascinating. It could lead us into an entirely other discussion, which we're not going to have about then how she thought about feminism and the role of women in Jewish life. Okay, but let's let's yes. bring Yehuda into the conversation. Um, uh, we're so lucky to have Yehuda with us. Every uh, class or program that I've done at the Hartman Institute has been so, even if when it's about contemporary issues, it is so deeply informed by an understanding of the past. And um, I just think that's profoundly important for, for Jewish education, Jewish educa engagement today. But so Yehuda is someone who is always thinking about the interplay between the past and present, maybe also has to deal with questions of exhaustion and bitterness about disagreements in Jewish life and, and your own public role. I wonder if you could talk to us um, by, uh, talk to us about what feels new and unique about what's happening today to you? What feels continuous, you know, with political diversity and dissension in Jewish communities in the past and what feels discontinuous? Um, just, yeah. yeah, that's a question. So um, I'll also just echo my thanks for the invitation to be here and to engage with Nancy's really lively and um, really fascinating study of the 20th century through this perspective. And Felicia, it's always great to talk to you. Um, so as you said, Felicia, political conflict between Jews is not a new story. Um, and, and it's not, it can't, it's not just re reducible to the jokes. It actually goes deeper than that, which is if you wanna make the claim that the Jewish people are not defined by ethnicity, race, geography, socioeconomic class, um, if, if we're not that, then we are by definition, a collective made up of difference. And as a result, political difference, ideological difference, theological difference is baked in to the very definition of Jewishness. Um, pluralism, as we like to say often, is a necessary precondition of believing in the idea of Jewish peoplehood. Because mm. if you wanna claim it's a religion, okay, all those who believe in X are in the religion. But once you make the claim that it is a peoplehood, then this is what you know, Arendt and others are, will call the, um, or, uh, 
uh, Rawls actually will call the, the fact of pluralism. It's just a, it, it's just a reality of what it means to be uh, a peoplehood. Um, the story I've been thinking with a lot lately is that, you know, the, in the Hebrew Bible, the story that constitutes the, the creation of the Jewish people and the translation from the story of a particular family to the story of a nation happens through the sons of Jacob. Because until then, it's choosing one son and rejecting the others. And the radical move uh, of the book of Genesis is that actually Jacob's, all of Jacob's sons become part of the network of Israel. And so tribalism gets baked in to the construct of Jewish peoplehood. And it's a story of tribalism that's the worst expression of it imaginable, uh, which is that, you know, which is uh, brothers trying to, to kill one another, uh, domineering over each other. Um, the result of that story that we have told about ourselves as a people is that the way, one way to think about this question throughout Jewish history is that we're constantly toggling between the collectivist impulse, how are we one people, and the tribalist impulse, uh, in what ways are we made up of warring and competing sub-tribes, where sometimes the stakes of those disagreements are theological. Um, you know, some of them are socioeconomic, some of them are political. And all of these moments in Jewish history, whether it's first century sectarianism or Hasidism or denominationalism are simply real kind of tribal realignments. Now, you know, I'm really interested in the last 30 years, as you said, and the feeling that there's something in the water in Jewish communal life right now that I wouldn't say, um, I wouldn't, I, I, wanna, I don't wanna go so far as, oh, this is radically different than anything we've experienced. The minute you say that, you invite the historians to march in and say, no, actually it was worse. Um, <laughs> but it's not, it doesn't have to be comparative, but there does seem to be something in the water in Jewish communal life, which is making the stakes of these disagreements so powerful and at least kind of hinting to us that the tribal instinct right now is much stronger than the collectivist instinct. And um, if we want to kind of think about what's in the water, uh, the way I've been trying to write about this lately is on, you know, we might call the rise and fall of Jewish pluralism. And something that was really an important conversation in Jewish life in the 80s and 90s led to the creation of a whole bunch of Jewish institutions. My own is one of them. And now, um, and seems to be kind of on the ropes as a Jewish idea. There's a lot of stuff that's in the water, a lot of which is larger social trends that Jews are imitating, both in America and globally, the social media and the echo chamber phenomenon, global political polarizations, risks to democracy and the nation state, ideological extremism, economic disparities, all of these stuff um, is going to be is going to be what motivates the need for encampments, kind of tribal encampments for people to have coherent theories, what does it mean to be a Jew in the world? But I had one other piece to this, which is we as American Jews have also been living through a period of uh, almost unacknowledged, but really powerful foment uh, in the transformation of what it means to be an American Jew in the last 30 years, revolutionary conditions that have been changing at the most fundamental levels, the very notion of the identity of the American Jew, the shared ideology of American Jewishness and the overall institutional infrastructure. Who's in charge of American Jews? What are our leading institutions? And, when, and it's not surprising as a result that when you have that amount of vulnerability and all of those kind of realignments and it's happening in a cultural context in America where Jews are actually comfortable. It's not, there is of course anti-Semitism, but Jews are actually part of the polity it's not surprising that Jews are taking this moment to kind of pull apart, create totally new realignments, and, and to do so in public. There's, you know, the, if tribalism is kind of a baked in instinct of Jewish peoplehood, then it's waiting for opportunity. And, um, and I think the last 30 years, both between, between the stuff that's in the water and the particular mechanics of Jewish identity has been, um, it's been like a great opportunity for this tribal instinct to take over. Nancy, how does that resonate with you? And, and what do you think uh, Lucy's life can offer us as a, as a model for how through all of this? So, you know, it was a Yehuda gave me my entry point is, you know, I'm an historian, right? And so I can tell you that where there were other really, you know, uh, polarized moments in Jewish history. I mean, one of, my, one of my favorite examples is relatively recent, which are the Sabatian controversies of the 18th century when, 
you know, the, the so-called rabbinate went after anyone they suspected of being a Sabbatian. And I will, I will not tell you who, but a very esteemed historian colleague of mine basically said they killed Ram Chal, Moshe, um, Moshe Lutzato, because of suspicion about his uh, Sabbatianism. So I will say as an historian, I think that we, you know, we always have to kind of, we're living in a moment and we think it's the worst. And, you know, I think that's just basically not true. But what I do think is true, and I hope I can relate it back to Lucy because uh, Yehuda's comments were so, I think, spot on, is that this, what we're talking about is an American Jewish story right now, not her European story. But in fact, that's the point, is that she was, as were most American Jews until like 1975, I would say we're still European in a funny way. What I mean, what I mean by that is look at the major rabbinical uh, uh, sorry, institutions, you know, those who train rabbi seminaries, all of them, had, almost all of them had American born leadership. I think Gerson Cohen is maybe the outlier, but, and then there's a sea change where the head of YU and the head of JTS and the head of HUC, I'm thinking Ellenson, uh, Arnie Eisen, and I think Jick, I might probably get the name wrong. All of a sudden you have American born Jews stepping up to be these seminaries, I, uh, uh, seminary heads. I don't know about Avi Weiss, but in, in terms of his institution, but I remember thinking, this is new. This is new. This, is, uh, this isn't Bernard Revel. This is something new. This is a late 20th century American imprint on this thing called American Jewish life. And that I think Yehuda's nod, nodded to that. And so that's the problem. The problem we are addressing now is a very much an American problem. And the Jewish community is struggling in our society to figure out who gets to define what a Jew, who and what a Jew is. And in many ways, many, many things are up for grabs, except for those communities, which in Adam Furtzenberg's very important term, are enclavists, those communities that have receded, they're anti-modern, modern modern communities. I'm talking about ultra-Orthodox communities. So um, in terms of Davidovich, it's a little hard for me to point to her. She died in 1990, and I don't think she had the vision, had that kind of vision. She wasn't looking at that. She did, however, feel that the, there was a future for American Jews and that, would, and that the moderate centrist orthodox, and that still was something that really existed in her day, had a key, had a key to understanding how American Jews should best shape their communities because that meant literacy in Jewish texts, that meant Jewish languages, that meant a com commitment to Jewish peoplehood through the enactment of the Jewish calendar, right, the mitzvot of the calendar, which put you on the same kind of time as Jews outside of the American calendar. And she felt that that was a place to look. She was optimistic about American orthodoxy. And she let her secularist friends know that their worldview about the great working class and Yiddish culture was a nostalgia and not something to look to, toward building. I hope that you know addresses. I mean, Yehud and I are coming in. You guys, you're communal activists, and I'm. I get to retreat to the library more often. Well, so let's let's keep toggling back and forth. So Yehuda, back to you. If we're in, especially because uh, Natan and elsewhere, I'm in the business of philanthropy. Philanthropy is about building the future, hopefully informed by. Talk to us about how you think we work our way through this as communal leaders, communal institutions, talk to us about the, the way that Hartman sort of embraces pluralism and what maybe some of the new challenges to that pluralist approach are that you're seeing. Yeah, so let me respond in one one brief way to, to something that Nancy had said, which is, um, you know, I, I when I read in the book about the the speech at the 92nd Street Y when, of, of Lucy endorsing Reagan, um, I couldn't help but think of the piece of the New York Times by essentially the next generation of Lucy Davidovich, which is Ruth Weiss, that comes out right before this election in which Weiss, um, the headline was vote for the czar, it's important. And without making too much of a, <laughs> not going too far into this, I, I was, we're not gonna have a partisan debate here, that's not the point. Um, there's a, the symbolism of an endorsement at the 92nd Street Y versus an endorsement in New York Times shows you the, the shift in the, in the theater where we, in, which, in which Jews are, um, are litigating their political differences with other Jews. And it's hard to underplay that. that mean, that's gonna be part of the temperature raising around these issues, 
which is we're not fighting internally anymore. In fact, we can't even speak of the language of an internal battle. Um, and that what that's gonna mean is that the hostility around this conflict is going to be higher because we are not only battling in the public square for this, we're also battling for what do non-Jews think about Jewish politics? What's the impression of the Jew in the public square? So I want to say two things about, um, uh, about what we do about this in terms of dealing with this. The first is to, not, to make sure we don't romanticize uh, uh, the, the absence of conflict. Um, there are actually significant divisions in America around political visions for our future. There are radically different ideas about what a Jew should do in the modern world. Those are important questions. And, the, and there, sometimes the nostalgia of the Federation slogan, the we are one stuff, um, actually uh, has the effect of almost gaslighting us as though the issues that we care about aren't supposed to be important. So unity is good right, if it's the product of, if it's, in, if it's intended or oriented towards some sort of value gain. But some of these divisions are really important. We just have to figure out how to, how to structure the engagement across difference um, uh, more productively. And I think there are really two strategies that I would put on the table for us to consider. One is, um, one is uh, a kind of utilitarian strategy or a uh, or a tactical strategy. David Hartman, who was a famous pluralist, he kind of, uh, in one of his essays has this confession where he says, one of the reasons I'm a pluralist is because I wanna convince other people that they're wrong. So how can I convince them that they're wrong if I don't talk to them? And if I don't, if I don't actually talk to them in a way in which I acknowledge that they might convince me that I'm wrong. Like if you're serious about that, um, you're entering into conversation. But the goal of that type of engagement is not um, valorizing neutrality or pretending I'm not passionate about the issues. It's just the willingness to kind of be in a risky place of, I want to convince you that you're wrong. The, uh, but the other approach, which I think is, which I'm drawn to a little bit more of a philosophical approach is um, the philosopher Avishai Margalit in his book on compromise and rotten compromise makes an argument for um, we should be the type of people who are committed to compromise. And let's use compromise as the language here of dialogue. We should be the type of people who are morally committed to compromise across difference up until the point at which we become complicit in something evil, what he calls rotten compromise. And his classic example is Neville, Neville Chamberlain. Until you reach that point, however, you should stay at the negotiating table until that point where you've engaged with rotten compromise. Now, the reason why this is an important idea is because the instinct is reverse, that people will say, since I'm scared of becoming complicit with evil, it's actually going to prevent me from engaging in the work um, of, of, of talking across difference. Um, and that actually, I think, is what has what has risen as a, as a cultural phenomenon of not just, it's not, I'll stay, in, I'll stay in dialogue with you until the point where I realize that we are not gonna see eye to eye and then we stop. It's actually, since I'm so fearful of being either seen with you or associated with you, that's the litmus test phenomenon. Because of that, I can't engage in dialogue or what we do is we attach, um, we attach the doctrine of evil so indiscriminately that once it gets touched by someone who disagrees with us, the very act of engaging with them becomes morally problematic. And that's what we've done to anti-Semitism. So that somebody said something that I've now characterized as anti-Semitic. Now, not only um, must you obliterate them, right? You can't even go near them. And if you are one step away from them, you've now engaged in rotten compromise. So what has to shift is a kind of dispositional sensibility of it's not, and it's not, um, it's not relativism. It's not, it's not like I, I, we want to allow people to actually be complicit with actually evil ideas or things that we find to be evil. It's just, do we have the fortitude in ourselves to engage across difference and to know what the threshold is of when we can no longer do that kind of engagement? So Nancy, just quick. Can I jump in for a second? Yeah, yeah. Second. And now we're getting Please. really contemporary. I think like everyone in there in the planet, we were watching various speeches this morning. And I saw, um, you know, Al Sharpton on the screen with Raphael Warner. And that was a moment where I thought, well, here we are. Who would have thought 
that Al Sharpton would be a statesman, right? There are all kinds of things we could say about Al Sharpton. So I think that's one of the challenges. We can't see the future. So how do we know what evil is? I mean, it sounds good, but we don't know where certain ideas lead. We don't know where they will find fertile ground. So why do I mention Sharpton? Is I think one of Sharpton's big problems is he never apologized. He never stood up in front of the American people and said, I was wrong about Tawana Brawley. And he needed to do that. He needs to do that. So I guess, and I'm not a communal activist exactly, here, but I would say that that's necessary in this compromise posture that you're talking about. You is that people have to be able to, people have to be able to say, "I was wrong then," and that's part of the challenge today, where the so-called cancel culture won't allow for mistakes, um, and everyone makes mistakes. The question is, a statesperson, someone who's a leader, someone who grows, someone who can see change. Think of. Rabin, it's the best example. Looks like Rabin, right? So I don't know where this really fits with Lucy Davidovich. I don't think she was very good at that, by the way. But um, you should still read the book. But um, you know, I think that that's necessary um, because I would not want to be in the same room with someone whom I thought was anti, who had set made anti-Jewish anti-Semitic statements who never disavowed them. You know, I mean, I never had a chance to be in the room with Amira Baraka, but I would have wanted to hear him say the poem I wrote at the time of the New York City teacher strike was wrong. It was, it was angry, but it was wrong. It did more damage than good. I would, I would have liked to have heard that from someone like Amira Baraka. So thank you. I, I know for sure this could take us on, a, on a, another uh, multi-hour tangent, so let's not do that right now. I will encourage, though, anyone who's interested in seeing how some of these debates play out to follow Yehuda on, first, on Facebook, actually, because Yehuda does a great job on Facebook of starting uh, long and often contentious debates and holding really, you know, has, a, has an enormous community of people who weigh in on all sides. And I think it's a, it's a really fascinating use of social media um, for our day for a Jewish leader. Um, Miri Dauber, if you could come back in, um, since I'm not able to see the chat and just let us, give us a question or two from the audience before we wrap up. Hi, great, sure. Um, so we have a question um, in reference to Lucy's position on Judaism, the word Jewish peoplehood was her focus. Is today's term secular, meaning secular Jew, the same as what is meant by Jewish peoplehood or are they different? So that's um, a wonderful question. And I um, saw it in the chat and I was very happy to have it. I think the first, I think the word secular is itself extreme, an extremely problematic term. It's not really a Jewish term. Um, it implies a, a binary between the secular and the sacred. We use those as heuristic devices to describe things. But anyone who has spent time with Jewish texts know that there isn't a clear divide between those things, right? The Talmud is not only a repository of argumentation and dissent, but it deals with the most mundane, you know, did your cow get gored on my land to the activities of the high priest on Yom Hadin. So Jewish civilization, Judaism is um, an intimate fabric of secular and sacred. So the challenge today is for those Jews who define themselves in some clear cut secular way, uh, how do they have access to at all the reservoir of the Jewish tradition to nurture the Jewish future? So I don't think Jewish peoplehood in Lucy's day came out of a secularist move. So it came out of diaspora nationalism of the 19th century, Dubnov and others, but as she moved and in the American context, she came to the conclusion, as did Max Weinreich, that Judaism, that Jewishness had to be in dialogue with Judaism and the Yiddish language had to acknowledge its debt to Hebrew and that you couldn't separate Jews into a linguistic enclave or a secularist enclave. And I'll, the last thing I'll say on this, because I see the clock, is that she was deeply influenced by a social psychologist named Leibish Lehr, who was the director of the Shalom Aleichem Folk Institute and ran Camp Boibelik. And he spent his entire life trying to come up with secularist rituals for the immigrant children of New York to give them meaning, a calendar, 
collective ritual behavior. And ultimately he realized that it was, um, it would not succeed, that it would not succeed, that rituals need to be linked to the long Jewish past and the sense of Judaism as a civilization. So here's a question for Yehuda. Um, Yehuda, your impression of how, how significant are voices like Dennis Prager and Ben Shapiro to the overall conversation? I try to make it a habit of not, um, not responding um, <laughs> directly, like a direct reference. <laughs> to individuals. Um, I, I think um, I'll make two, uh, well, let me say a couple things. One is, I think the media, um, media like talk radio, um, especially that are built around um, where it's, where it's effectively a one directional uh, form of communication with a single voice is part of the problem. Um, I, I've tried, uh, trying our work at the Institute that there's virtually no seminar that is taught by the same faculty member over and over again, multivocality part of the brand. Um, in the podcast that I host, I bring in guests every time and try to have the best version of a conversation across ideological difference that's possible, even though I'm not I'm not, I'm transparent about my own commitments and convictions, but that's not the point. Um, so I do, I think that some of the, some of what, what passes for ideas-based media right now is really contributing to this, the, in this and, and what you, we can, you can visualize an individual in a silo being spoken to by another individual and just nodding their head. And in what way have we been challenged? And in what way, in what way have we grown? I think the harder piece, Miri, to the question is, you know, media is the, we are, we get the media we deserve because we are the consumer base. So what is it that we as a consumer base have to start demanding and seeking out in order to build a momentum that says, no, this is not, this is not that interesting. Simply having dogmatic ideological viewpoints that are hammering a certain set of ideas home it's just, it's not what we need. Now, there's all sorts of reasons why we anthropologically and psychologically seek that kind of media out. People like being affirmed in their viewpoints. Um, they like having access the memeable, you know, 30 second uh, clip that I, if I share this with the world, other people will agree with me. Um, I, I get what the psychological appeal of that is, but you can't, you can't be excited by that, whether it's the people you agree with or don't or, or don't agree with, and then be surprised when our civilizational discourse is just not what it should be. And a follow-up question from a different viewer. How can we foster conversations, study groups, or study groups that are open enough um, to have people of political differences study together? So how do you do that at Hartman and Nancy? Have you also been in, in academic settings in conversations um, with people of different perspectives and how do you create a place where cancel culture is on hold enough to have the conversation? Look, I have the great privilege of teaching at a great public institution. I have very, very diverse students. Um, so I often have students in my classrooms from all different perspectives. It's not as diverse as the rest of Rutgers because students who take classes in Jewish history tend to have some kind of relationship it's either because they're Christian and they know religious history, they're interested in the Jews, or there's some family member. But my job is to foster a safe environment for people to say what they think. And I like to think I do that. Um, and the most important thing I hope to um, help them do is that if they have an opinion, I want evidence for the opinion. So I am famous or infamous for telling them that I don't care how they feel. I know that would get me in trouble in a lot of places, but I tell them I'm happy to listen to them in my office about how they feel. But in class, they have to, they have to express an opinion that's based in some kind of what we used to call facts. But I think, I like to think I do a very good job. I've had, um, you know, and I have students sometimes who come in and say, that upset me, or, you know, I don't think you represented this position, but the key is, uh, creating an environment where people of difference can speak freely. That's, that's what the academy should be. So I don't have a lot of patience for cancel culture. And in some ways, I'm at a stage in my career where I can not ignore it, but I, I can do what I do well in the classroom and, and not be a policeman for bad behavior. I, mean, I know that sounds strange, but I, that would take up all my time and energy, policing bad behavior. And Yehuda, how do you see that working 
in the larger Jewish community when you're out or on Zoom, whichever we're doing, you know, with congregations, with Jewish institutions of creating spaces for people to have these conversations. Yeah. So one of the things that we found, which I think is key to being able to do this, we, you know, we, we, we sometimes describe some of our work as storm chasing, which is if it's a source of controversy, sometimes communal controversies are actually inverse witnesses to your values. So if, there, if, if we're arguing about something, it might actually be that there's something significant there that we should actually figure out how to study more effectively and talk about more effectively. Um, but the way in which I think that that happens is through um, kind of two opposite strategies. One is Hartman conversations tend not to be open-ended. What is as Nancy said, what does everybody think about this issue? We put faculty in the room, we put source sheets in the room. And what that does is it triangulates the discussion. So, you know, whether I'm reading Lucy Davidovich's speech at the 92nd Street Y or Genesis 37, um, I have a scholar in the room who is putting forward ideas and then creating a space for people to engage with those ideas, permission to disagree with those ideas. We try to cultivate a faculty that doesn't feel threatened by disagreement by people. But, but what, what I've seen happen is that students and program participants oftentimes get actually, it's like a little bit weird, get set off more into political disagreement by when you create a vacuum at the center, <laughs> because then people are competing for the space. Whereas if you triangulate the discussion, mm -hmm responding to text, responding to an idea, responding to a scholar, something else happens. I'll just tell you also, the places where it's most like, more likely to see a political controversy take place in a Jewish community, the Hillel controversy around a speaker, a federation crisis, is oftentimes because the staff or the educators take a back seat to the content they're inviting in, as opposed to being the, the curators saying, no, no, I have a vision for this. This is why I'm inviting the speaker. I'm going to tell you what it is. And you can agree, you can disagree, but I'm holding that space. So I feel that that's a big piece of the work. And I think the second key piece of the work is not creating preconditions for entry. No, no ideological litmus tests in order to participate. Um, that means challenging our learners that they're not supposed to apply ideological litmus tests to the faculty in front of them and challenging our faculty to not do the same to our learners. Now it bubbles up, it, and it, it, it bubbles up more. In the last two, three years, I've seen more litmus testing in our programs, uh, especially by younger people than I saw before of, I can't listen to the speaker because of their position on X. Um, but if you're, if, you're, if you're adamant about it and you're consistent about it, and if you do make sure that students also know that there is a diversity of viewpoints in ways that favor their viewpoints, we just have to, we have to stay committed to that. And it, it, means, it means less, like debates are not that interesting. <laughs> Like, oh, the rabbi gets out of the way and says, okay, here's two viewpoints, go at it. Not interesting. All that does is it pushes people into their polls. But here, I, the leader, the educator, am going to convene this conversation. I'm going to do the best possible reading of these viewpoints and allow people to respond to it. That actually becomes the exact model of the type of a communal discourse that actually is productive, that you might actually learn from, uh, as opposed to simply re-aggregate back into our teams. Thank you. And um, Yehuda, we have a question. What is your podcast? The podcast is called Identity Crisis, but it's identity slash crisis. The slash does a lot of work. Uh, <laughs> but it's on all, the, it's on all the podcast uh, apps. This um, has been a great discussion. We are running out of time. So I'm going to, um, for questions that were not asked, we will um, share them with our panelists. Thank you all for joining us. Um, conversation was fascinating and we learned so much. We hope you'll join us at the end of the month for our next conversation with Dr. Sinkoff as she joins uh, with two past Natan book honorees, James Leffler and Susie Linfield, discussing Hannah Arendt and Lucy Davidovich, Zionism and Israel in the minds of two great intellectuals. You can find out more about that in our chat. Thank you all for sharing in this important conversation. Thank you, Nancy and Yehuda. Thank you, Felicia. Um, and we hope to continue this conversation and see it continued in a larger sphere in the Jewish community. Thank you and have a good afternoon. Thanks everyone.